It's my pleasure to be um, with the Chigas region. And uh, I'm so glad to be here for a number of reasons. First of all, I find the people of this place very open-minded. Um, you know, interestingly, I was coming um, to Chigezi and I was reading a newspaper, um, a column by one of the people from you know, Chigezi region, but who stays in the diaspora, saying uh, the people of Chigezi are open-minded, they want to hear ideas, they will listen to all presidential candidates. And uh, I'm glad to say that that is exactly what I found in this region. Um, people are open-minded, uh, there's a lot of people who want change, but then there's a lot of people who are open-minded as to what kind of change they want, and they are asking very interesting questions, issue-based questions of what do you have for the, this region, for the people of Chigezi when you become president. And um, uh, those are the kind of questions that I want to hear because um, there are so many problems that are not just, okay, there are those that are unique to this place, but then there are those which are, you know, uh, general across the country. And everybody is asking themselves the same questions. How are you going to solve this issue? And um, when I come to a place like, you know, Chigezi, especially, you know, this, actually the whole of Chigezi, I see, um, of course, a great deal of potential for wealth. Of course, it's very beautiful and uh, and classified place. You know, this beautiful and you, when, you want, when you come here, you're almost sad that you have to continue on your campaign trail um, and you wish you had come here to chill. Uh, because of the beauty of the place, I like the cold weather and so on. But um, the beauty aside, there are so many things that this region has in terms of potential to make people rich. And of course, my whole campaign is about making people rich at a personal level. That's what I am all about. And when I come to Chigezi, it's not that difficult to see what we can do to make uh, the people of Chigezi rich. For once, uh, for one, for one, of course, uh, we can talk about the. the the potential this place has for tourism, for great amounts of tourism. And um, that's something that can bring a lot of wealth to this place. And I've been somebody who is favorable to um, to having an airport nearby. I suggested Kasese because uh, it's near so many important things. First of all, of course, there is a big airstrip uh, which can be upgraded to an international airport. That's the important thing, international airport. And I said there's a number of reasons why that will improve you know, the wealth in this part uh, of, you know, this part of southwestern Uganda. For one, there are very few tourists who want to come and land in Entebbe and spend eight hours on the road. Um, that takes a whole day of their time. And usually they have five days, six days at most in Uganda. So they don't want to travel a whole day to just come to the place of their interest. And for the most part, a lot of the places they're interested in at this side, there's all these crater lakes in this place, uh, wonderful, beautiful places. Uh, there is, of course, uh, the windy, impenetrable forest not far away from here. Um, um, and uh, going further up, you know, there are national parks and uh, so many game reserves in this place. So there's a lot of interest in this place. But the trouble has always been the distance traveling here. First of all, there has been issues of roads. And the roads, uh, our road network is not good and it's not safe at all. And uh, recently there was tourists who died on their way coming here. So now we, intro we, we, we cut that away by reducing the amount of travel time that was so they can fly straight into um, southwestern Uganda, come, they can go and climb Mount Renzori, they can go to the crater lakes in Toro or, or in Chigezi region, they can go to, you know, the windy impenetrable forest uh, in the side of, you know, Kisoro and uh, in Chigezi here. And, they can go to Queen Elizabeth National Park just a, an hour or so away from where they land. So it is minimized travel and there is a lot of potential there. Now imagine using just the same windy forest. Majorly, Rwanda has almost the same number of tourist arrivals as Uganda. I think in 2018 they were talking of 1.7 million tourist arrivals. Uganda was 1.8 million. That's very sad because we have so many other things to offer that they do not have to offer. And even the gorillas that they have marketed very well, we actually have a majority of them, 53% of those gorillas are in Uganda. Rwanda has only, I think, 17%, less than 20. Uh, the rest of them are in Congo. So they are making, but they are making more out of the little that they have than we are out of what. Now, if we actually promoted this region as a real, you know, tourism hub, there is a lot of money that can come. Remember, every tourist lives between a thousand and two thousand five hundred dollars where they come. When they come in this place, uh, even for a few days, they live minimum of a thousand dollars, but it goes up to two thousand five hundred on average. So now imagine all that money coming here 
in these hotels here, um, uh, in all the services this place has to offer, and in all the other things that this place can offer. There, there's cultural tourism, which is a very big thing. There's a very rich culture in this place, which can bring people. Well, actually, culture, cultural tourism is the third biggest thing that makes people move to just to go and see other cultures, because they can get game game parks from elsewhere and what, even if those are important. But the cultures, there are things which are unique. So. If the people of Chigezi can market their culture and make it you know, a big thing, which of course would help them to do, just out of cultural tourism, they can get a lot of you know, um, money coming here. Imagine all those arrivals coming to this place and leaving a minimum of $1,000, uh, but actually going topping up to $2,500 within a short time of us marketing this place. Uh, the country benefits, but especially Chigezi benefits. Yeah. That's a lot of money to put in a place like this and it will transform people's lives. So when I come to Chigezi and I'm looking about financial liberation, how can I make people rich in Chigezi? The answers are just right there. Yeah. Number one is tourism. The second thing is, um, is uh, has a lot to do with uh, the agricultural potential and the fact that there are so many things which are being produced here, which we are importing from other countries. Some of the b biggest fast food ch uh, you know, the net, the chain, chain outlets in Kampala are importing Irish potatoes from, from Kenya. That's not good at all because there is a lot of Irish potatoes they can get from here. So now why do why do we have to go to Kenya for Irish potatoes when we can get them from here? But you see when you don't have um, a government that really cares about the welfare of people, people can just do about everything they can. But we can say, you know, they, we have Irish potatoes here, very good, very good soils. I don't believe there's anything Kenya can do that we can't do in terms of agriculture. It is not there. We are blessed with better soils, better climate than they are. Okay? Uh, Uganda has half of East Africa's arable land. Half of East Africa's arable land. The other countries share the other half. That's a big thing. So, there's, um, um, in terms of agriculture, there's so much that we can do to make everybody's life here better. In terms of tourism, so much that we can do uh, to make everybody's life here. In terms of utilities, okay? Um, which are still a big problem. Water, electricity, which should not be a problem. Okay, I, I, I fail to understand why Tanzania, which buys el some of the electricity from us, actually has much cheaper electricity, yet they buy from us, and much more stable. Okay, Kenya gets some of the electricity from here. It's cheaper there, even Rwanda. Even Rwanda. How is that possible? because of course there's the, of the monster of corruption and so on. So if we get out of that and solve the electricity issue, make sure that we can preserve all these trees and what by make sure that, making sure that there is a strong penetration of electricity in Uganda. Currently, I think we are about less than 20%, something between 18 and 19% of the electricity penetration across the country. So trees cannot survive because people need energy from somewhere. Now, if we increase that penetration, um, to around 50%. Remember, we are producing about 1,200 mm. uh, you know, uh, what you are, megawatts of electricity. Mm. And um, um, we are consuming only half of that. Mm. That includes even the one with the Central Tanzania and Kenya. It's just over 600. So we, are, we have an excess of 600 megawatts of electricity, um, which is not being utilized which actually government is paying money, about 30 billion shillings every year, for it to be stored because it's produced and not used. So the storage costs money. And yet there is, you know, very intermittent electricity around this place. There is no um, assurance of having power of any kind, not just here, but across. So if we deal with the money in people's each pockets um, through agriculture and tourism, if we sort the utilities of water and electricity, and if we can improve the quality of education, which has gone so bad, I'm telling you that I see there was a survey which showed that a majority of primary school teachers cannot have the level of proficiency that is expected of a P7 person. Not, not the students, the teachers, the teachers themselves. That was a study that was done by some foreign, I think NGO or something like that. And I, I, I was reading part of their study and it was shocking. Now, when I look at some of the students that we churn out of our schools, the kind of books, and I'm not talking about something that we are aspiring to get, I'm talking about something that we had. When I was in school,
by the time I finished P7, the, um, the level of literacy that I, I had reading, the books I could read, I remember the volume of books I was reading in my P7 vacation. In S4, I was reading. Now, you find even university students who cannot read anything close to that, who have finished university. There's something that happened to the quality of education. So people are coming out of universities who do not have the, the requisite levels of basic literacy. Okay? And then there's also courses that are not helping in regard to what it is we are promoting. Now, there's a tourism course in some of this, whatever, but we want to make it more practical because that's where we are going to be focusing a lot of our, money, of our energy. Because the World Bank report says that Uganda can make $10 billion from tourism with just simple $30 million marketing of ourselves. Because tourism is about marketing. Okay? Um, tourism about So $10 billion, that's a lot of money. That's our, our, the entirety of our budget for this is $12 billion. All our budget. So $10 billion coming from tourism, that's a big, big, big money. So if we channel a lot of people through that to understand the unique things in this country, to sell them, to be able to sell them, because you find a typical person, even from Kigez here, who does not know anything that is special, that is in this place. And then you find somebody coming from even another country, and they spend a week here, and suddenly they are so enchanted by the beautiful things in Chigezi, and a person from here cannot describe so. What do you have in your place? He doesn't, he doesn't know. And yet, he should be in position to say, this is special about Chigezi, this is special about Chigezi. And so many things, because there are so many special, even somebody who does, like me who doesn't come from here. When I come here, I am so blown away by, you know, the beauty, the, you know, um, uh, the different climate, you know, the, the absence of the heat and so on. So, it's a beautiful place. So, there are so many things that run through my mind that I can do, but I've just mentioned a few top of my head. Tourism, agriculture, getting markets, markets for our produce. People produce things, but they struggle at the level of finding a market. Because number one, we are importing things which we are not supposed to be importing, which can be produced by our people, so that we cannot encourage our farmers to, I mean, we cannot help our farmers get rich when we're importing things they can produce. Um, then, if, so if you sort that, you sort the markets issue, and uh, the utilities issue, quality of education, and quality of healthcare, which is also very low, just those few things. Um, in two years, in a matter of two years, people's lifestyles are better. Our life expectancy is higher. People have more money in their pocket. There's generally more money in the place. And um, nobody is struggling to find three meals a day if they wanted to. Maybe those who are watching their weight can have less, but those who want to can have three meals a day. Um, you know, there's, um, uh, there's the issue of market even for dairy. That has been a big problem here. People having a lot of milk, but selling it at very, very huge losses. And they are selling a litre at 300 shillings, a litre of milk at 300 shillings. And that same litre is being sold in Kampala at 2,500. That means somebody in between is making an abnormal profit. And that's not fair to the farmers. That's, and those are the middlemen who have been set up by this government. So we have to change that. Make sure that the person who is at the lowest end of production, the farmer, um, uh, the, the, the herdsman who has his milk and all these people get the bigger share of their, you know, the bigger value from their produce so that, um, you know, uh, they get rich and they are the majority, you know, they are 75% of them. So by just taking away that exploitation, you make three quarters of this country richer. It is not rocket science. Um, it is so easy and it is what I intend to do. And um, every place I go, I know exactly what I can do to make the lives of the people of that place better. And that is what my heart, my heart is, my whole campaign is about that. How can I put money in people's pockets? And people don't have to worry about school fees, worry about money to take children to hospital and so on. It is sorted. Um, they have enough for that and enough left over to, you know, to have a decent life. You can find them in that sort of form of lifestyle, uh, mindset, but it immediately changes for two reasons. Number one, people demand money if they listen to you and they realize you don't have anything for them. So they say the only time I'm going to receive it, like, like this government, there's nothing Museven is going to tell anybody and you think he's going to, he's a liar, everybody knows it. So you just say, give me money, let me go. That's all you're going to get from me. You know you're not going to see him again for five years. Now, when I come with a different mindset, first of all, I don't have all the COVID money and all student government money with me, they know that. But if you come and somebody listens to me, they realize that actually, um, uh, 
I don't have to get money from this person if he is actually meaning what he says. And in a short time, they realize I mean what I say because I have all these things at the back of my head. And I'm speaking things not like somebody who is just has read them somewhere. Uh, somebody who comes and studies and looks, goes around. I came through all these places before I stood for president. And I walked around and asked people, how can we do this? How, is, how come this is like this? Where are people poor here? What is the main activity here? How can we change people's lives here? I, a year ago, I knew I was going to stand for president, but I didn't come out. So I just come here without, you know, the burden of all this. And I talk to people privately. And I found out from farmers, I find out from people who are involved in the tour industry, I find out from hoteliers and so on, what it is that they want. And um, I'm just asking out of curiosity. So the thing is, people only demand money when they realize that's all you have. You have no ideas. You have, it's, I'll give you an example. It's like you go to, uh, to ask a girl out and she realizes you don't love her you it's just a moment or thing she'll say okay give me money because that's all you have okay but then somebody goes and says you know i have i love you i want to marry you i want us to build a life together she's not going to ask you for money so it all depends on what they perceive in you so if somebody goes and she sees a future in you a future that involves her she's not going to come out up front and say give me this amount of money actually if she if she does that you know she doesn't see a future in you however if she sees a future in you, she's actually going to even scale back her needs and so on and um, uh, be very calculative of even, even if she's in need, she will not immediately put it out because she knows that this is a long-term thing. Now, I am selling a long-term prospect for Uganda, not a short-term one. Now, the short-termists are coming, selling different things. For one, is selling money. For the other, one, is selling we hate this money, he has to go uh, and so on and all those other things. I am selling something long term because even when he goes, what, what next? Is that, are you sure we are going to have the future that we want? Have any of the other candidates actually offered a clear cut path of how to make people's lives better than myself? And the clear answer is no. So when people listen, even those who, and I can tell those who have bought into the financial liberation message, when they come, they say, Let's, uh, they come with this attitude of, you know, there's money, presidential candidate, he has money. By the time they finish, the questions they're asking, but how are you going to safeguard your votes? Now, you see now that somebody whose mindset has changed. Now, he has changed from I want money to the point of safeguarding, safeguarding your votes. Then you say that, that that is a heart that has shifted. Then they say, okay, what if we vote for you? Do you have people to safeguard your votes? And so on. Then the next thing you know, the man is saying, how can I join your team? Okay. And he's joining your team voluntarily, eh, no money. Then you know this person sees that I am not playing for a one time. I'm playing for keeps. I'm not going <laughs> He says he finds them in a line. They don't want to hear you. They just want you to start giving money. We don't, they say, you've had five years to talk. Don't waste our time. Just give us money. A man, some gentleman told me, a gentleman told me, that, listen, the man stood on the pulpit to talk. He said, you, you man, what are you talking? You've had five years to talk. I am here, my wife is here, my children are home, just give us money and we go. And that's the mindset. Because they know those politicians, they are not interested in them. Okay? Really, they are not interested in them. Now, it's easy to say when I'm standing. But the truth is, I am actually interested in the welfare of the people. And it is genuine. It is not me just saying. It's for my heart. And I, every time when I'm moving, I find somebody, you know, Yesterday I told the story of how I went to Kazinga Channel and the man was convincing me to go down the channel and I, I asked him how much money do you get? How do you receive? Um, what's like your good day's income and what? And I'm just asking him questions for nothing and he, you know, we're just conversing. And uh, I'm finding out how can I make this man's life better? I wasn't even campaigning that time. I, I didn't even ask him for a vote. He didn't know me. I didn't know him. But I was just finding out, okay. So it means that these people, all these people are no tourists. The man says he earns 70,000 shillings a day on a good day. I say, if I increase, increase the number of tourists, these, all these people earn money and they don't need the government except to bring more tourists. Bring more tourists. Yeah. And after that, the man moves away from peasantry to a middle class, middle, middle income. And, um, and, and that's a good thing. So how many of those can we have? Then the country starts thriving. We cannot be richer than the people in the country. That was a fallacy. That was a, a lie that a country, Uganda, can be rich when Uganda is poor. It's not possible. 
the reason America is rich is because Americans are rich. It starts from the people and the businesses that thrive. And then after that, the country. Now, with the poor people, we will have a poor country. And so it's going to be that way. But poverty has been used as a political weapon. Now, that's why um, they are closing all NGOs, which they suspect might bring money to support uh, candidates, because there is somebody who knows the only thing he has to say is here is 10,000, vote for me. Here is 20,000, vote for me. But if he stood there without money, and I stood there without money, I can tell you 100% of the people who listen to us would vote for me. A hundred percent, not one would vote for him. If he had no money and I had no money. And it is just ideas. So he knows the only advantage he has is money, stolen money, of course. Now he's going to make sure other people do not have the money. So this is the sort of elections we find ourselves in. But the truth is, eventually, we'll preach the message of financial liberation. And people who are financially liberated are politically liberated. Because if these people become, okay, I imagine I am the president, I fulfill my promises. Five years from now, all of you people, including you people, have a lot of money. You have, you know, have bought lands, you know, you have cows somewhere, you have what, you're living middle class income, but you're still a journalist, okay? But you have a lot of investments behind you. Then I come to interview you. Now, I have to convince you, I can't give you money. You have money of your own. You understand? I, I, you know, there is nothing to offer you. Now, all politicians who come to you at that stage, nobody's going to give you 20,000 to vote for them. You are rich. You see, what is 20,000 going to do? That's just a few liters of milk from your cows, which you have. So, now politics becomes about ideas. And that is what I am all about. I want to turn our politics away from Kizantre of give me exchange into ideas where you have to sell ideas for people to vote. Now when I come as a middle class person, you're asking me what do you have for us? Yeah? And that's the only if I if I my answers are not satisfactory, sorry, I'm not giving you a vote. So we've elevated politics to that politics of idea. And that is my plan for this country, where politics is about ideas. There is no other way we can develop as a country unless we start having politics about ideas. Remaining? Yes, yes, there is. I've covered a lot of the districts. Mm. Uh, I've covered West Nile, I've covered uh, um, Acholi sub-region, sub Lango sub-region, Teso. I've been to Soga, I'm going to go back there. I've been to uh, Busia, Bukedi region. I'm going to go back there one more time uh, before the election runs out. Um, I have had, there are some places in Buganda I haven't been to, but I, I have some time there. Uh, in, in Uganda, especially this other side of Uganda, um, uh, the, the, the western side of Uganda. Um, I, have, I have time even in the other side of Uganda, the Bulemezi side, um, that's the side and so on. I have time there. Uh, from here I'm finishing Chigezi, I'm going to, I'm taking the upper route, Kasese, Toro. I've been to those places before, but I'm going back there. Um, Kasese, Toro, um, Bunyoro, um, then I come back to Kampala, then now I go back. Then uh, uh, the New Year's I'm in Karamoja, back through Teso. So I, 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 I'm going to cover as much as I'm going to cover. The truth is I can't cover all districts. Because you see even here in Chigezi sub-region, I will do three out of all the districts. I can't go to Rubanda, I can't go to Uchiga, because there are 46, 146 districts, and we have only 60 days to campaign. So I go to the major you know, um, to the major dis uh, cities or districts or town centers in those places, and I focus on that and then use a bit of radio. So, um, I'll do what I can, and um, I know my places where I have support, okay, and I know where my message has gone out, and I know where my message has been received, and I know that there's a lot of quiet support for me in the places and people who are determined to, you know, uh, to go ahead. And I have a lot of volunteers who are moving, uh, carrying my message. Volunteers, volunteers. So, um, and the beauty of volunteering is, you know when somebody volunteers, they, their heart is with you. If I had money to give them, they would still do, but I don't know if what they, where their heart is, um, because they can be doing it just for the money. But if there is no money involved and somebody says, okay, if this is what you promise us, and you mean what you're saying, I'm going to go and do whatever it takes 
to come as support for you. Now you know that somebody who has you at heart. So that's a beautiful thing. I will cover as much as I can, but I've covered already a lot of the country and um, there's still some parts I have to cover. Thing is, uh, the 11 candidates, yes. you cannot, it's, uh, it's not easy to ensure that there is no clash. And then there are some districts where, for instance, if I, if my schedule says I'm in Ruchiga, Ruvanda, Kisoro, for the most part, most likely, I would even be spending a night in Kavan and then going to Ruchiga, coming back. And that's expected. Now, when I go to Arua, um, I'm covering West Nile, but I'm going from Arua, um, let's say to Ajumani, to Koboko and what, and then coming back to Arua. So now if somebody is in Arua and I'm supposed to be in Koboko at that time, we might clash in Arua, but I'm not officially there, I've been Koboko. But I go there and come and spend the night in Arua. So you go and be in one place and cover so many districts from there. So um, how do you, for instance, how do you ensure that there are no candidates clashing in Kampala? Because people who are campaigning in Luero, in, in Jija, all of them would, if they are from Kampala, would come back and spend the night in Kampala and then go out the next day. As long as the clashes don't cause issues. Because yesterday I was in here and I, I believe uh, there was another candidate here. And um, and yet, I, for the most part, I try to make sure I don't clash with Museven because there are issues that come with that. Because he's not a candidate, he, 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 he doesn't behave like a candidate, he behaves like a president who is just going through a process of being recrowned. So I try to, but the others, there's no problem as far as I'm concerned. The Electoral Commission map event, you'll read it. They will have me in one district and two other candidates in one district. And as long as one of those candidates is not Museveni, I don't mind. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening to me, um, the people of Chigezi. I, I love this place. Uh, I love the people of this place. I love the fact that they have been very welcoming, very open-minded, and uh, we were promised that, and actually we found that here. And now I thank you that um, I found some support here, and I'm asking the rest of you to give me your support. Vote for me. I am the kind of change that you want. And uh, I, I can tell you that with a straight face. I am the kind of change that you want. And uh, all the things that I speak about, I speak about them from the bottom of my heart. I do, I'm not just saying them in an election cycle. I know that I would say them even if I was not in an election cycle. We, this country deserves better. Thank you.